It's question show time. Your questions, my answers, wherever you are on my channel. If a question pops in your brain, just write it down on any video. I see them all. I'll gather it up and I will answer it here. All right, let's get into it. BoJ, such a waste of taxpayer money. It literally does not benefit humanity in any way at all. This was in reference to the cool new telescopes like Louvoir, uh, that are the video that I did about Louvoir and the other new telescopes that are coming. And this is the point of science, right? Is that science is about an investigation into nature itself. It's our curiosity. We're trying to understand how the universe works. And we don't know in advance which are the amazing groundbreaking discoveries that will change human life more than anything. Think about all of the wonders that you use every day. The fact that you can be on the internet, the fact that you use a computer, the fact that you don't die of childhood diseases the way you did, how there is so much more food thanks to agricultural discoveries. Basic engineering and science like lasers, we don't know what these turn into. You just investigate nature and then over time people figure out what these things are for. So of all of the things that have the potential to directly make our lives better, right? Science is the one. When you think about, I don't know, cigarette smoking or military, right? A lot of these don't necessarily have the possibility to make our lives better in the way when we spend a tiny little fraction of either of those things that I just mentioned on just trying to understand how the universe works. It is the best investment that we human beings have made in the history of humanity. You've become so accustomed to the amazing advances that have changed your life in so many ways for the positive that you've become kind of numb to it. Well, it's going to keep going. We are going to keep learning about the universe through telescopes, through microscopes, through particle accelerators, through lasers, and who knows what the future is going to hold. Good and bad. Kenneth Lepre. Hey Fraser, with Starlink and whatever Bezos is calling his service, does that bolster the effort for space-based telescopes? Will ground-based telescopes become obsolete? I don't envision ground-based telescopes ever becoming obsolete. There is a ton of advantages to using a ground-based telescope. And the biggest one is the fact that the telescope is on the ground, right, where we are. And so you can work on the telescope, you can upgrade it, you can maintain it, you can if there's a problem with it, you can fix it, and you can do that without having to wear a spacesuit, without having to send an expensive mission to space to be able to repair it. There is tremendous value to having space telescopes. In some cases, there are certain wavelengths of light, like x-rays and certain versions of, of infrared that can only be seen from space. And there are lots of other advantages too, but I don't think we'll ever get to a point where we don't use ground-based telescopes. In fact, engineers have been developing really some of the most incredible advances in interferometry to be able to merge telescopes together, in adaptive optics to be able to minimize the effect of the atmosphere to make ground telescopes ever more powerful. When you look at the budgets of some of these gigantic ground telescopes, they only cost only less than a billion dollars, while space telescopes cost much more than a billion dollars to even get them up into space, and they have a shorter lifespan. So no, ground-based telescopes forever. But I mean, astronomers will take space-based telescopes too. Why, why choose? Tom adds, I have a question. Phobos is going to break up and impact Mars in the future. If we gave it a push to happen now, could the impacts thicken up the atmosphere and make it a better place to visit? Are you some kind of super villain? Because that I don't think that would help much. Um, if you crashed Phobos into Mars, you would be causing a Chicxulub level event on the surface of Mars. You would be gouging out an enormous crater. You would be kicking up material into the atmosphere, clouding it out for a very long time. It would be a very bad day, and I don't think you would end up with an improved Mars. You'd end up with a bad Mars that, as the dust finally cleared out, it would still suck. And part of the problem is the fact that the the solar radiation that's coming from the sun, the solar wind is constantly blasting away the atmosphere of Mars. Until you block that radiation and the, and the solar wind, you're not going to be able to really improve Mars for any long term. You've got to set up some kind of block that protects the Martian atmosphere, and then you've got to thicken it to the point that it becomes more livable. So resist the urge to kick Phobos into Mars, you monster. 
Lyserian, do you think we should make an effort to bring China in on collaborative space projects like the ISS? I think that collaboration is always better that so many research projects, uh, international collaborations couldn't have been done without scientists and telescopes from around the world working together. So if China would have the opportunity to work on the International Space Station, I think that would be great for the International Space Station. It would be great for Chinese-U.S. relations. I think China is planning to launch their own space station and they're inviting countries from around the world to run experiments on their station. I think that's all good. Whenever you have countries that work together, that trade with each other, there's a reduced risk of them going to war. So we should always encourage more collaboration all the time. Neil Ramsey. Fraser, I had a question about the communication faster than light. Entanglement, as I understand it, is the particles move instantly in relation to another particle, no matter the distance. Could this be used as a way to communicate over long distances without all of the lag time? Either that or a subspace transmission. I know this idea of entanglement as a way to transmit faster than the speed of light is just its so tempting, right? That you have two particles that are entangled so that they're paired with each other and then you move them apart any distance. And if you observe one of these particles, say you observe it spin up, then the other particle, its spin, when you observe it, will be spin down, right? They are linked. The problem is, is that there's, and, and that happens instantaneously, right? And so until you observe either one of them, they remain in this quantum state, and then when you observe one, then it defines the position of the other one, and it's random up, up until that point. And that's like amazing. But the reality is, is that there's no way to actually use this to communicate any information. And the reason is because no information is being transmitted. When you observe one of these particles, right? See that I flip a coin, right, and it says heads. And so I write heads in one box and I close it up and then I write tails in the other box and I give one box to one person and I give another box to another person and they walk to very distant places. They're both holding their box, right, and they share information amongst each other. One person opens up their box and looks and sees heads. And so then they know that the other person will have tails in their box, but they won't know whether or not the other person has observed their side of it. So they'll know what they're going to get, but they won't know that they've observed it. And so there's no way. The only way that you can actually transmit information is you actually have to communicate behind the scenes. You have to call up the other person on the phone and say, I got heads, that means you got tails. And the person says, yeah, I got tails, that means you got heads. And that communication has to happen at the speed of light. If there was some way that when you observed one particle and it would cause that other particle to collapse in a way that you could tell, then you would be able to transmit faster than the speed of light. But literally until you decide, either person independently decides to observe their particle, they don't know what the other particle is doing. So you can't use it as a way to transmit faster than the speed of light. I wish. Rachel Quinnell. What are your theories on crop circles? I think human beings with boards and ropes are pushing over plants into various shapes. They've, the people who invented crop circles have admitted that's what they've done. They've shown people how they did it. And uh, it doesn't feel like real proof of aliens, of like folding over corn. Bert, 1038. Using weights would help with the gravity issue as far as muscles and bone is concerned. However, it would greatly increase your mass. Imagine running with a backpack weighing 500 pounds and then trying to stop. So this was back to the question of like, could you wear like a weight suit when you're in lower gravity so that you, your muscles would be under constant stress? And that would really help. But, but as you're saying, that even though you're not experiencing the same kind of weight pulling you down, the same kind of gravity, you do have the same amount of inertia based on your mass. And so if you have a 500 kilogram suit that you're wearing as you're running, it is going to have 500 kilogram mass worth of inertia. And then you try to stop and it's going to try to keep going and you will need your muscles to push back against that inertia. So you, even if you could wear a suit that made the force that you were experiencing downward be the same as if you were you know, here on Earth, as long as you stood still, it would feel kind of about the same. But as soon as you moved, it would feel really weird and you wouldn't like it. So unfortunately, that's only going to get us so far. Rusby, 
With most rocket engines running fuel rich and Starship planning to burn methane, I'm shocked that nobody has brought up concerns with the amount of unburned methane released if used for travel across the Earth. As we enter this new rocket age, we're going to see more and more of these rockets putting out enormous amounts of carbon emissions. The cool thing about the Starship is that it runs on methane, and in fact the methane the plan is for it to be produced directly out of the atmosphere. So there is this process where you can pull in carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, use water, and produce methane. And so in theory, this whole process will be carbon neutral. Now that said, you know, you talked about unburned methane. So if you're bringing in carbon dioxide, which is a greenhouse gas, and then you are burning methane, but some of your methane is getting out into the atmosphere. Methane is a much more potent greenhouse gas. So I wonder if you're going to get to this place where in fact, even though you're turning carbon dioxide into methane, the methane is harder on the atmosphere, would contribute more to warning. So more science needed. Martin Wilkie. How is Saturn's moon Titan able to keep a thick atmosphere, whereas Mars has lost much of its atmosphere? The sun's solar wind is what is buffeting the atmosphere away from Mars, and Mars has no protective magnetosphere. And so the solar wind particles just bump hydrogen atoms off of Mars and out into space, and it's just gotten drier and drier and drier. But Titan is orbiting Saturn, which is much, much farther away from the sun than Mars is. And so it's just not getting buffeted by the same amount of solar wind that Mars is. Also, Saturn has its own magnetosphere, not as powerful as Jupiter's, but it still has a magnetosphere that extends out and would contribute to helping to redirect the particles away from its moons, in the same way that Earth has been able to protect its atmosphere thanks to its magnetosphere. Mr. World. Hey Fraser, what do you think of the idea of harvesting neutrinos as an energy source, similar to that of normal solar cell technology? The problem with neutrinos is they don't interact with anything. You know, I've mentioned this before. You can send a neutrino through a light year of solid lead, and most likely it won't get stopped. It's not going to interact with any particle in that light year of solid lead. The only way that we can detect neutrinos at all is by having enormous vats of water that are very careful and sensitive. And every now and then a neutrino bumps into a particle of water and releases a cascade. So how do you use a thing that doesn't interact in any way, shape, or form as a source of energy? I, I can't imagine that any time in the vast future we will be able to harness neutrinos as an energy source. That said, there's a lot of them. Each one has a little bit of energy. If you could figure out a way to scoop them up, uh, you probably could harness energy. But I'll leave that to the Type 3 civilization in the vast, far future. All right, uh, that's our question show for the week. Uh, as always, I really enjoy these, so please keep those questions coming. Wherever you are on my channel, if a question pops in your brain, write it down, I'll gather them up, and I'll answer them here. I'll see you next week.